Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brooklands, and as ever, thank you for being here, and thank you for supporting the Trust. The director at the back is waving me to move to the middle of the stage, so I must do as I'm told. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Steve Clark, and I have the pleasure of organising and hosting these events on behalf of BTN. Special welcome to our guests and non-members. We'd love to see you back again, but more importantly, we'd actually like you to become members, because we quite like your money as well. There are some benefits, no doubt. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm filled with a little bit of sadness and joy. Joy because there's so many of you here tonight, and it's fantastic to see you. Sadness this is because it's our last motorsport uh, legends talk of the year. You meant to go, ah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Fear not. <laughs> the pantomime season is on its way. Um, oh, it's behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you'd expect, Steve Parrish and I have a long conversation this evening about who we're going to uh, kidnap and bring along in the new year. Um, I'm going to throw a few ideas around. Um, hope we'll be able to entertain you, even if it's just Steve. You, 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 you know, I'll go in a minute, but the reason that the army are here tonight is because they heard that Steve was coming back. <laughs> I'm also having a conversation with Simon Taylor uh, to talk about the uh, car aspect of next year as well. So personally, I can't wait till 2018. What a scary thought that is. 18 years since the millennium. Wow. So I can't think of a better way to finish the year off with these two gentlemen. Will you please welcome Steve Parrish and Ian Hutchinson. Splendid. I, I, I beat you. It's the only time I've ever beaten Ian Hutchinson up onto the stage. And I had to come round to the little step because I'm old and he just jumped up on the other end there with a bad leg. Uh, lovely to be back here again. Um, and uh, it probably is because I'm here that the army's here because normally I only come back twice to apologise. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be back here again this evening. And it's an exceptionally great pleasure to be here uh, with this young fella, Ian Hutchinson, because you've got a book out and it's going to be for sale later on, you're going to be signing it, but it's called The Miracle Man. Well, it looks to me like you're going to be a double, double miracle man if, uh, if it all goes according to plan. Hutchy, I've never known anyone take so much pain as you do. Uh, I don't know if he was going to announce it, but Ian actually was uh, rushed into hospital on Monday. Um, and if he wasn't going to announce it, I am. And he had a blood clot on his lung, and he got out of hospital yesterday, and he came here to see you guys. A round of applause. There. <laughs> Fortunately, if anything goes wrong tonight, I am a doctor, you know that. <laughs> so, um, is there any nurses in here? <laughs> Fine, okay. Fine, that's with Ian, I take it. <laughs> it's never me, is it? Shit. Um, but brilliant that you're here, Hutchie. Um, I'm going to kind of try and start at the beginning because I'm going to wait till the end to find out the end. But how did it all start? How did you put yourself through this life of massive injuries? I mean, what, you're a, I think I'm right, you're a stunt rider, is that right? Cunning stunts. <laughs> a madman on the road. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I was always into bikes as a kid, but it was never allowed one. My parents have been pretty much against them, so I'm a bit short rest because of this. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, um, so I always asked for a bike and wanted it. I didn't really know what I wanted, I just wanted a motorbike. And now we got this far, I can say I can understand why your parents didn't want you to have a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, so uh, eventually I think. I just mithered them that much that they got me a trials bike when I was 15 in the hope that I'd never want a road bike. And uh, a close friend of mine that, that I was going to school with was actually a British youth trials champion. So I was obsessed with going up and watching him all the time. And 
I got into trials, so that was the start of it at 15, really. And then um, exactly what they didn't want to happen. As soon as I was 17, I took my test and got a road bike. Right. So I'd done, my, uh, I'd done a few of these, like, work experience and <coughs> Saturdays at um, Colin Apple Yard and at Alan Jeffries, two local bike shops to me. And then ended up doing my motorcycle mechanic apprenticeship for Colin Apple Yard. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Who was a lovely gentleman who yeah. sadly passed away a couple of years ago, yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 So uh, I caused a bit of havoc there. Cost him a few quid with a few problems, but... <laughs> what, crashing bikes? Oh, one of them was nothing to do with a bike, really. <coughs> I knocked a 205 litre drum and degreaser down Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> had to get a fire brigade in the local council, had to clear it up, it cost him two and a half grand. <laughs> so, talk us through how that happened. It was on, they started getting into bringing these 400 CCs in from Japan. All the CBR 400s and all stuff like that. And, uh, took over another unit over the road and they wanted to move some stuff over to work on the bikes there. So they did that uh, ATV um, farm quads and yeah. he, he was into everything. Right. So they put this drum on the back of the trailer and just as I rolled off the kerb to cross the road, the drum set off. <laughs> Spinning right. around. Well, it got nothing to do with you doing about 40 mile out the time you went off the kerb, I guess. <laughs> Normally, you know those things, they have uh, one hole in the top that you take a cap off and put a tube down. Yeah. This thing, the whole top came off. It meant to have a, it meant to have a big clip on it here, yeah, but it wasn't on, so as soon as it finally went over, Jesus, it caused some mess. <laughs> uh, you kept going, I take it? Well, the quad set off on its own, because it, it took all the grease out of the road. So the quad started skidding down the road. I'm hands and knees running trying to stop cars, so there's not an accident. And then about four hours later, I was upstairs and a colleague came in. Effing and blinding that he'd been sat in a traffic jam for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't get into work. No idea that it was his problem and, and that not only did he been sat in a traffic jam, it cost him two and a half grand of it cleared yeah. up. So that went down. Did you keep your job? I did actually, yeah. And then uh, I finished my apprenticeship there. And then obviously I was just riding road bikes to, to test bikes and had my own road bike. Met a group of lads and I think this is probably where I sort of, I got pushed a little bit as for my age difference because I met a group of lads that were 21-ish and I was 17 yeah. and I got a road bike and they'd been doing it three or four years. Right. So I had a teaser R250 RSP, absolutely beautiful thing, I think they call it a 3V <coughs> something or something. Not the reverse cylinder, the V twin. Okay. Beautiful, right. but at the time I did, it just looked pretty and I, won. I, bought, I got finance on it and bought it. Right. But um, yeah, I crashed it a few times and it completely died the last time fork went through the front of the front cylinder and it was written off so but I see him now on the fetch fortune and yeah. he's only about seven in the country. This was the bike that you'd actually bought though, you'd purchased yeah, this one? Yeah, so. Um, but each time this happened, you were right? Yeah, well I was keeping up with them and I think that's what brought me on and, and obviously everything we were doing were on roads. But so you, you didn't hurt yourself? Did you? No, I had a couple of silly ones like flipping a wheelie in the Isle of Man. Mm. Went to watch the TT and had a massive rucksack on. And we were looking for our digs, we had like a homestay thing. And all, all of them were on like Fireblades and ZX7s and dead easy to wheel it. Obviously the little teaser that was a bit hard work. And they were wheeling and I was jealous. Tried to wheel it and I flipped it. Bounced off an XR3i. <laughs> Before I knew it, my mate had picked me up, got me back on the bike, he's bumping me off down the road, I'm not about to like this. He's picked up the number plate and shoved it in his pocket. Bumps the bike off and I'm off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back wheel's absolutely bent in half. <laughs> so, and the, so there's someone in the Isle of Man still looking for you with a exactly. pen three, three. Actually, it was my yeah. sister. No. <laughs> um, so how the hell did you get home from the Isle of Man then? Well, I ended up bodging it. I got a hammer to the back wheel and then it cracked the rim straight right. in it. So I had to put an inner tube in it. Right. So little did I know how dangerous it was, but... Dennis Trollope, we didn't know anything about racing or anything, but somebody had told us, Dennis Trollope's your man, he'll be in the paddock. Loads of teasers out of it. So I got a master cylinder and a break or whatever I needed, and obviously didn't worry about the panels. Mm. Put the inner tube in. Did about 13 laps on Mad Sunday with a back wheel vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> Never really thought anything of it, just carried on. Came back and fixed it, and then had, I had a little incident before that, actually. I'd been out on my own. <laughs> Decided that tonight was the night to try and get my knee down. 
absolutely impossible to get your knee down on the corner that I was trying. I couldn't do it now. Where? It's like a 90 degree. Where, 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 which corner is this then? It's just a tiny little corner on the, on the top road by me on Ilkley Mall, oh, basically. Okay. And uh, yeah, I slid off, oh. I slid into a banking. So uh, I had to reverse the bike into the garage backwards that night so that my dad couldn't see the fairings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, it sounds to me like you did well to actually get off the road up to racing. Do you actually ride a bike on the road now when you're fit and well? No, no I, occasionally I've been out on one, but... Right. Do you have a licence? Yeah, I've got a licence. Yeah. Okay, so many riders have <laughs> but It's quite true, actually. So many Grand Prix riders... And, it's actually a good point. It's something I was so lucky with because I passed my car test, I put in for it before my birthday thinking there's a massive waiting list, I was told there was a massive waiting list, and it came through for 10 days after my birthday. Right. So I had a bit of a mission, I rang up an instructor and said, I've got my test in 10 days. And he said, how long have you been driving? I said, I haven't driven yet. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit of a job. And I passed that, and then for one reason or another, I did about five bike tests and never got through them. Really? Not, not always because I failed, but I failed the first one. Think for, for, for trying to get your knee down. <laughs> the second one I went to, the kid ran out trying to play chicken or something in the road. They scared me, the kids play or whatever. And obviously I'm going down the middle and clipped the kid's foot. So I'm skidding down the road on the DTR 125. And I was totally alright, but I smashed the indicator. So I said the police came and the kid was alright, there was no problem. I said, listen mate, I've got to go, I'm going to do my test. So I got there and won't let me do it because the indicator was smashed. So it just kept, things like this just kept going on. Eventually, they were closing for Christmas on the 20th, it was the 18th. There was no test centre around us that had a test available. And after Christmas, the new rule started where you had to be 21. Right. So I was stuck, so I had one the head, main head centre and said, I need a test anywhere in the country. I'm desperate to get my test back. So they booked me in for one in Doncaster. Hmm. So I put it on a car trail and put it on the back of mum's car. Drove down there and prior to this, Colin Oakley had a lent me a DTR 125. And I thought, I think what's going wrong here is I look a little bit too um, a rebel, you know, I've got all the Apple Yards jacket, racing jacket, and right. this DTR. Yeah. So I said, Can I have a bike a bit shitter? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so the Apple Yards don't do that, do they? They pulled me out this brand new Suzuki <coughs> GS 125. Proper old man sort of thing, but brand new, fair enough. To Anyway, I got my dad's wax jacket on and I bought one of those shit yellow stripes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought nothing is stopping me this time. Got to Doncaster, parked up, pulled the bike off. And I rode to the test centre and obviously I didn't know one road in Doncaster. Oh. So he came out to do my instruction with me and everything's going alright. And then when they don't say turn left or right, they mean go straight forward. So we came to some traffic lights up a hill. And I stopped at the lights and he hadn't said anything. So is he on an earpiece? Yeah, he's following me. So I thought, right, we're going straight here. And when I got to the top, there's like cars everywhere. It was like four lanes. I thought, there's absolutely no chance I'm going there. It must, you must only be allowed to go left. I must have gone to see. So I did my checks, put my indicator on, turned left. And then as I got over the crest, <coughs> you, could, you could have gone straight. I realised you could have gone straight. So I was like, that's it, job's fucked. And that's what I got on. Was just, the rest of the test was just a disaster. Didn't make an emergency stop, wasn't interested. Got back, said you passed. Like, said you looked surprised. I said, well, I went the wrong way. I said you did, but you didn't do anything wrong, so I can't tell you. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, Perfect. Did a celebratory wheel and flipped it. <laughs> <laughs> but you got it back on the safe sound. Yeah, Actually, uh, I'm just going to show my age now because you, you had an earpiece when I did my test, which was in 1928 or whatever. <laughs> I did it at Stevenage, and back then there was no earpiece. The guy used to stand on the side of the road and say, if you go up here, take a right, down there, take another right, and then you'll come back past me and I'll step out and you do an emergency stop. That's how it all was. I got completely lost, and the boat stood there waiting for me. I came from behind him. <laughs> so I never had to do my emergency stop either, and I got past, so it just goes to show. That. So you, but actually, in, in British Superbikes, in MotoGP, World Superbikes, an awful lot of the riders actually haven't got the test licenses. Because yeah, I they think never it's in the start races, kids, isn't it? So they have no need to ever go on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you kind of went to the Isle of Man, but did you straight away know that the Isle of Man was for you? Had you no, kind of... no, uh, what was it, 97. First year we went in a van with bikes in a van, slept on the bus prom in a van, and uh, watched, no interest in racing there whatsoever. 
just wait till the wheel is. I was upset with wheel is. Right. So as soon as the race finished and side cars were out, I was off wheeling up the side street somewhere until the roads opened. And uh, I liked Mad Sunday. We used to go over the mountain, but we used to go back through Laxex. I was okay. too long going all the way around. Right, okay. So what bike are you on now then? Well, that was the TZR in 97, and then I had a ZXR 400 the year after, and then a Fireblade. Right. So that's a disaster, isn't it? 19 years old and a Fireblade. Yeah, it just sounds, just sounds horrendous that you're even here talking to the I did actually crash it, but it wasn't my fault, the Fireblade. <laughs> <laughs> Who told that? Dickhead man decided to buy some cut slicks and they were like concrete. Right. We didn't know anything we were doing. They were like Michelin things, obviously no tyre warmers. Right. We'd been at a barbecue right. and I pulled out the drive, obviously you have to exit in a bit of style. Yeah, with a wheelie. I did exit in style on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Again in the Isle of Man? No, that was in England. Oh right, okay. Yeah. There's one or two people say thinking you're completely mad. Well, yeah. you're, you're, probably, you're probably right actually. But. So, when did racing kind of get you? I mean, the, the, you, you said you got no interest in racing in the early days. What, what kind of hooked you into that? Was there any particular person? Well, we went from that. I started working at a place called Hobspot Racing, so all we really did were race bikes. Okay. So I started seeing a lot of race bikes then. And took As a mechanic? Yeah. Took a lot more interest in them. Started learning how to tune engines and build engines. And I loved doing that, you know. Um, so, we, we decided to do some track days instead of road racing, right. as it was. So um, track days were just sort of a new thing then, yeah. never really yeah. been about. We did a couple of track days and it's really expensive, you're on your road bike if you crash it's a disaster. What circuits you on? We went to Cadwell and we went to Alton, right. I think it was it, maybe Croft. And then, um, and then I don't know who came up with it, there were four of us mainly that used to go on our road bikes and three of us ended up going club racing. Right. So we all sold the road bikes and bought just some cheap 600 race bikes. Right. Joined the New Era Club. Mm -hmm. We got given a caravan. Right. So <laughs> I bet that was nice. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> the shit that was. <laughs> 17 foot long thing it was. The guy said, oh yeah, go collect it. The pack got <coughs> like horseshoe shapes. Mine's in the fifth horseshoe or something. Right. It's got a Ducati sticker in the window. I thought, this thing's going to be nice. Yeah. I got there in a shape of van that was Hobsport Racing. It was one of those old um, police riot vans with a V8 engine in it. Oh yeah. Made a lot of noise and didn't really go anywhere. But Sherpa thing or something? Yeah, yeah. Sherpa, yeah. <coughs> and uh, pulled up there and looked in. It didn't really look to be a bad caravan in this new shape. So we set some rocket. Uh, it was there. With the old style twin line Ducati sticker in the window. Shittest thing you've ever seen in your life. But the guy was with us, so we had to look like we were really happy about it. Brown it was. Right. Took it back. We got some paint. Just painted it blue. And rolled it blue, <laughs> ripped out the toilet and stuff inside to make more room, but we didn't realise that was holding the whole side of the oh. <laughs> <laughs> It was a bit flappy. Right. And then, uh, that was us then, really. We just we had mega fun, to be honest. Uh, Going club racing, uh, drinking in the clubhouse at night. And I, think, I think, truthfully, most people that I talk to, the fun was the early days. That was, that was kind of what what it was all about really, well it certainly was with me. And I do wonder nowadays, some of the guys that are kind of starting out, they're going to miss that, aren't they? Because mm. a lot of them just sort of, parents put on a little bike when they're six years old and then they go to an academy and then they get to this. And, I mean, towing that caravan and it, the wheels falling off and all the things that go on are part of, part of your education. Really. Yeah, I mean, oh, the star is going club racing, was brilliant. And even, it just gets worse and worse every year. Now our kids that won't do this, won't do that. Yeah. You know, never touch a drink even in winter when you're at functions. Yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> but yeah, I had to have a bottle of wine to get me to sleep because I was so nervous. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it definitely helped. Okay, so you now decided that you've got the bug for racing or you kind of want to do that. I guess money's a big issue. You're still working as a mechanic. Mm. Yeah. Sponsored by a credit card by then. Yeah. Fortunately, they weren't actually sponsoring it. No, they just, you just kept using their money and not paying it yeah. back. <laughs> It was so your card. I was a bit it was my card. Six of them. <laughs> Ended up with six of them. Did you? Six yeah. credit cards? I never told anyone. I lived at home with my parents, I just kept going at it, but yeah, I was addicted and uh, ended up winning some club racing by the end of the year and doing well and a customer had built this lovely R1 and I'd finished it at Hobsport and he said, Do you want to race it next year? So that was sort of the start of getting sponsored, I yeah, suppose. Right. So I moved to the MRO national championship. Yeah. And uh, in at the deep end, I don't think I even qualified at the first round. Couldn't afford to do every single round. And then the last round, I finished third on the podium at Snetton. So right. 
And then through all this, I've been friends with Dave Jeffries from working at Jeffrey. I left that play out at some point and with uh, Alan Jeffries, so I got to know DJ quite a bit. And he won the 2002 It'll Be TT, and part of his uh, bonus was Suzuki G6 5000. So I've got three of those. And he let me want to do British Superstock with him in 2003. Right. So in 2002, one of the other lads that was doing the club racing with us, he went to the Manx Newcomers race and finished fourth in it. So that kind of gave me a bit of a, that was the start of me wanting to do the team. Because you kind of knew his level, I guess, did you? Yeah, yeah right. You I thought you, better than him. you knew you were better than him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, hmm, I fancy a go at that now. So anyway, I was off on this path with the G6R and uh, didn't have a shilling still. And then I had a massive crash. I think in at the deep end again, not qualifying, it was a bit of a disaster. And then I went to Thruxton and I was running in fifth place and DJ was in third. I could not believe it. I almost wanted to like, pull up because I was in fifth and DJ was just there. I just wanted to tell him, I'm just behind you, I'm just behind you. <laughs> anyway, I got red flagged and we come up on the grid saying the start you where you were. So I was, next day I was like, DJ, DJ, I was in fifth, I was in fifth, so he was peaking. And they restarted the race, so I took to the front and absolutely rode the bike off. Oh, no. so, His bike? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I was like nearly in tears, bike's wrecked, DJ, what we're going to do? There's another round of Hulton the week after, he's like, don't worry, get me a list, let me know what you need. He, he was running his own team that year, remember he ran oh, the white yeah. bikes? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he was actually getting his own parts anyway, so anyway, by the Tuesday morning, I think it was, knock on the door, massive box of parts, everything I needed to fix it. <laughs> Unbelievable it was. So uh, I made it to all, and then... Um, and then he died at TT then. That, that, yeah, before yeah. you'd even got there. Mm. Right. I wasn't going to TT. Right. I, I, I that was 2003, so Craig had done the Manx in two. Right. I wanted to do it, but I still, wasn't, I still right. hadn't had any plans. Right. That must have been a massive, well, it was a massive shock to the whole industry and the whole motorcycle fraternity. Um, but you went in 2004. Three, it was. Three? Yeah, I went to TT in four, yeah. After DJ had happened. We still went out, because I was going to go out and do a pit bar and help out for him. And we didn't know whether to go or what to do anyway. We went out, right. and then after the senior race, I won 280 quid in the casino. Right. And that was exactly how much the entry fee was for the Manx. Really? So I shoved it in an envelope and put it through the Manx little, that green office. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And then about two months later, someone asked me what the money rang me up. We found this envelope, what's it for? <laughs> so it's my entry for the Manx. Like, was that, that was done at 3 o'clock in the morning after you came out of the casino, was it? <laughs> not even our office. Where's the farm? Where's this? I was like, oh, I don't know. So anyway, I entered it. Then I didn't have a 600. You could only ride up to a 750. J just, I'm just going to go back a little bit. At the time DJ got killed, you were still riding his bike, though, were you? Yeah, I was still riding the bike in the British Superstar. Right, yeah. OK. Right. So I ended up selling the bike at the end of the year to pay Tony back. Yeah, right. So, yeah. And um, Tony let me keep it for the rest of the year, then. Right. And uh, so then I liked my mate's road bike in the end. He had a brand new CBR 600 F Sport. Lovely thing they were. And um, he was into the man, so it didn't take too much convincing. But obviously, it was his brand new road bike that I wanted to go race around the Manx. <laughs> he got a bit involved in it. We put a race bearing on it, and that was it. Went out to the Manx, had a seven and a half ton, I was half converting by then, so a bit of workshop, a bit of mm. living space, and mm. went out and that. And then um, I won the newcomer's race. Right. On so that brand new bike? On that road bike, yeah. And uh, set the fastest ever newcomer bike. I, 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 but you only knew the bit that went over the mountain, no, yeah. did you? Did you? You didn't know the rest no, of it? No, well, like, the, 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 the kids that go now, they're, they're obsessed with it. I think Pete Hitman did 100 laps in a car. Yeah. And then yeah. he plays the computer game, watching the onboard. Yeah. I literally did not know where I was going when I was riding. I thought that's what you were meant to do. I thought like, you just learn it. Simple as it takes you three years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it takes you three years, you know, I just learn as I go along. Right. But you'd kind of done a few laps on your little yeah. ones, bits and pieces, but mainly the you knew the mountain quite well, I guess. Yeah, I knew the mountain well, and, yeah. and that was it. Right. But you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is considerably easier for anyone coming here. A, the, the, the organisers, Milky Quail, and those guys take you round and round and round. They give you videos and, and stuff like that. And, and I guess. When you turn up there, you've got a real good idea, not the speeds, but you've got a real good idea where everything goes. But I did the same as you. I think I did about 10 laps in the transit. That was because all I could afford the petrol for. Um, and, and like, I used to learn bits of it. We'd do five miles. I'd get my mechanic to drive it the wrong way around and I wouldn't look. And then we'd go back and do it again. So we'd do the same section over and over again and things like that. But you literally just learned it, racing it. 
Yeah. 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 Um, and how many scares did you have then? Yeah, I didn't really. I've never really been one for getting to the point where I have scares at the TT. Right. Obviously, you have stuff that you see on TV that looks like yeah. that looks scary, but you know what it's like when you're sat on a bike, it yeah. doesn't, it just happens and then yeah. you're back. Yeah. So, yeah, I've never really had anything. I've never been up a curb or anything. Right. Till, uh, 2015 when that bike ran out of fuel. I saw that, I was commentating on it, yeah, at Bedstead, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I watched that last lap and you got a nice lead and you're up on the curb. Mm. Yeah, it did scare us a bit commentating on it. Did you see, talking of getting on the curb, surprisingly, two years ago, Bruce Anstey at the top of Bray Hill. Yeah. What happened there? Just no idea. No, I haven't any idea. But he went down the curb at about 160 miles an hour, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, just as if, massive. just never even flinched and carried on. Probably, like, yeah. probably, yeah, probably wasn't awake, actually. Probably was nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, knowing our Bruce. But, uh, I mean, you're a very fast short circuit rider, we know, and you were doing really well last year's championship, finished runner up in the super stock. This year was going really well until your accident. Is the TT, did it, did it give you more of a buzz than short circuits? Yeah, I've loved doing both, to be honest, and I've had a couple of years of just doing one or the other with my injuries. And when I decided coming back from the last injury that I wouldn't do short circuit, I missed it, really missed it. Right. I came back from the TT. I did the first three rounds in superbikes, get myself ready for the roads, and then came back from the TT and never rode a bike until the Ulster Grand Prix. Right. And then never rode a bike until Macau, and I just thought, I can't do that, you know, no. I'm a bike racer, and this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I've sort of set my focus on being a bike racer, so I can't break away after the TT and start going off and try to buy and sell something, and mm. I just want to be going bike racing, so mm. I thought I'm going to give it one more shot, and that's when I did the deal with Tyco BMW to do right. stock again. Yeah. I and had a cracking year. Yeah, I said, I said at the start, I think they were only expecting me to do three rounds because I said, we'll do the first three rounds if I'm shit, then I'm not going to come and crying to you if you pull the plug, you know, after the TT. And I went into the TT second in the championship. Yeah, yeah. And then we had to, a round clash, that kind of blew it for us last year. A round clashed with the TT. So I missed the race. And then when I came back, I was always on the back foot a bit. And then I was catching Taylor. And then he wiped me out at all. And yeah. I just never really went for us after that. Yeah. But Still a mega year and I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it looked like you did, you thoroughly enjoyed it. And, it. and it must make you sharp when you get to the roads, it has to, doesn't it? Just your braking and everything else. Yeah, I think <coughs> riding so hard, you, you, you have to ride those superstar, anything in the British Championship, so hard to be at the front. Yeah. And uh, when you get to the roads, you know, you, you've been riding at that level, there's no way you can really ride like that on the roads, but you have to ride hard in a different way. So yeah, yeah, you're yeah. used to muscling the bike and managing the bike. And, yeah. Yeah. And if you're not ridden the bike and you get to the TT and you have a little slide, you're going to be thinking, whoa, why did yeah, I have yeah, that? Yeah, sure. When you're having them eight times a week. And in theory, you kind of know the bike better. It's, it's part of you, isn't it? Things yeah. like that. So your first TT win must yeah. have been rather special. It's something that you, everybody wants to do. Uh, when, you, when you got that, do you think, had you any idea you were ever going to go on, what, 16 now? No, it was like up and down because I, I, I quite enjoyed my first year at TT in 04 with my own bikes. My best result was 10th. And then... And then I had a really bad year in 05 with some, I got a team ride and the bikes were terrible, breaking down everywhere, mm. never finishing racing and stuff. But I had a fifth on my mate, my mate 600. So it was still there and then I rode for McAdoo in 06 and podiumed every single race, finished second in the super stock race. And that sort of sparked it from then, I thought, I can do this now. And, um, and then Honda were on the phone and you know what it's like, a, well I presume everyone thinks that you want to ride for Honda yeah. if you're a bike racer. And I was up at Croft at the time, riding me on Suzuki Super Stop Bike. I was still in bed because we were out to like lunchtime or something. And um, the phone rang, Neil took to her. So a bit of a grouchy, still in bed. And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm up, Neil. <laughs> and uh, this is, would you come up to the truck to see us? So I jumped up, got dressed, linked it up to his office, ran up inside, and would like to make you an offer to ride for us for next year. It was the shittest offer you've ever. Was it? <laughs> but I would have rode for that. I'd have paid to ride for them. And I went, well, I'm not going to ride for that. And he went, right, okay then. Well, go in and think about it and we'll get back to you. So I was like, okay, so what to have What the fuck am I doing? And <laughs> factory on the, yeah. obviously the work factory, but yeah. British Implant Honda at the time, lovely bikes. And I went back to my little shitty daft van. <laughs> that 45 rusty van and uh, down to Laos now. I wondered obviously. what I'd done. No, this was in the paddock. Oh, in the paddock, right, okay, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then never heard anything. And then we were at Cadwell and he rang me back. No, sorry, the next day he raised the offer. 
only <coughs> where this was. Everything else was the same. It was to do British super sport for them and the roads. And you raised the offer by 10 grand overnight. Mm. And I thought, well, that's pretty good really now. It's, you know, I've never been paid to ride a bike. Mm. And I said, hmm, it's not really what I was thinking. <laughs> you must have thought you cheeky little twat. <laughs> 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 so I went home. Um, we went to Cadwell, you know, all weekend, never rang me. Oh. Obviously, I could yeah, be You're thinking, oh no. I thought I'd blown this now. So I never heard anything. Then went to Silverstone all weekend, nothing. Then on the Sunday, he called me in, and I was adamant with my figure. And I told him, hey, no, we can't, we can't go to that. And I said, well, <coughs> that's how much I want. And uh, it went on and on and on, and eventually he gave me it. Did he? So, yeah. So, your game of poker worked. I was happy enough, yeah. yeah. Your casino worked. Yeah, worked. sweat yeah. off the head. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I rode for them. And so, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I've been there in some way, but it's all of a sudden getting paid for what you do for a hobby is pretty special, isn't it? It was, it was brave of you to stick it out, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, did you have any advice for anyone, or is it just in your own no, mind? Just, yeah, just what I'd heard and what I thought. All right, so you've been yeah. doing a bit of rum rummaging around, so yeah. everyone gets paid. Right. So, yeah, it's... And considering what some kids are getting now, it was good, really. Right. So, yeah. but... Um, yeah. yeah, it's tough though then, because then you're being paid to do it, you, you're not just, you don't quite enjoy it as much. No, that, that's what I was saying. I think, to, <laughs> for my mind, most people's, the fun side of racing motorcycles does come in your formative years when you're around with your mates and having a bit of a giggle. Like you say, once you're being paid to do it and you've got lots of sponsors and, and the Japanese are around and everything else, then all of a sudden it, it does become very, very serious. And it, it's hard not to take it very seriously because you know full well that you're being scrutineered, you're being watched the whole time. Um, you can still have fun riding your bike, but yeah, the socialising side, you have to be careful, don't you? Yeah, it goes up. The, the whole level of how you go racing just steps up massively because yeah. obviously you go out to Spain with all the testing, yeah. your flights are paid and booked and everything's done for you, you're just yeah. told to get here by a certain time. Yeah. Every, you don't spend a shilling from getting on a plane in England. No. You get there, they'll give you like 100 quid a day to pay for your food. Yeah. You go testing the motorbike every single day, they're throwing new tyres on it, it's just like, yeah. Jesus, this reality. Living like, the dream, really, isn't it? Come mm. back and I was in the British Super Sport, I struggled like mad, it was a brand new CBR 600 that year, and uh, I was really struggling. And then um, I had a crash, caught back marker up down Cascades at a third round at Alton, and it was right before the North West, it was a bank holiday Monday weekend, at uh, British right. Day, yeah. and the first night of practice was tomorrow for Tuesday. And uh, this back marker came across the front of me. I went end over end down Cascade. I thought I'd broken both my ankles. I was laid there in agony. And uh, I hadn't done my ankles, but I'd put my arm out at some point and done my shoulder. So I couldn't lift my arm up from my side. And uh, they'd said, you're not doing the north west. I was like, oh, I'm definitely doing the north west. I'm all right, just pull the muscle or something. So I said, if you have to have any painkillers or anything, you're not doing it. So I set off out to the north west and went to see the doctor. I said, I need to come see you tomorrow morning about six o'clock and get an injection in my shoulder. <laughs> Before I took to the point, anyone gets here. So I had this injection in my shoulder, but I still couldn't lift my arm up. So every time I walked to the bike on the grid, I had to walk to the front of the bike, grab the handlebar, walk around there, and get on the bike with my hand on the bar, and then I couldn't take my hand off the bar. I couldn't hold the handlebar. He is mad. <laughs> so I get a mega start, go down all the long, long straight, and then as soon as I break, I couldn't hold the bar. So I had to, like, oh, I'd just had a really crap northwest. Oh. And, a, and a super bike. I think the first night of practice was wet or something, it might have even been cancelled. And the next one on my first flying lap coming on the coast road, they had a bit of a problem with the alternator on them that year, they had no Woodruff key on it, it used to shear the bolt yeah, off. Yeah. And the whole flywheel came out of the side of the engine on the coast road. Oil everywhere, so I never qualified. So I had to start in the back row of the grid, and you know what some of the quality of the bikes are at the northwest. Yeah, yeah. There's me at my first northwest as a factory underwriter sat on the back row of the grid, surrounded by heaps of shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I planned out. And uh, the bike was a missile. As soon as I got into the straight, I passed like 10 bikes, and I think I was finishing like 6 or 8 or something. And then we went from there to the TT. And there was one week, just like obviously the Monday to the Saturday before the TT started. Myself, John McGuinness, and Michael Rutter all went straight away from the Northwest with motorhomes. It was the best week's crack ever, really. Right. We went out and got leathered every single night. <laughs> <laughs> I think it fixed my shoulder. Right. But anyway, me and John were the only two riders to finish on the podium of every single race, and we both won the TT as well. Right. That was, that was my first win. That was your first win, and it all, all sort of went on from there. Yeah. Um, the 
TT has been very, very good to you, but it's also been very cruel to you. Um, your five wins was just spectacular. It was just, I mean, you're probably best known for that, I guess, arguably. Uh, you have to say that um, you were riding exceptionally well, but the bikes that Paget gave you was also exceptionally good. You know, I mean, they're just the reliability alone is something special, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of it came from it was the first time I'd ever rode for a team for a second year. Right. So in 2009, I hated the superbike. I really, really struggled with it. The way the power delivery was, it was just horrible to ride. And uh, obviously, Clyde listened to everything I said and went away in winter. Honda themselves had developed a better engine as well. Right. And then they, they came back with a different link for the shock. And the bike was so much better in, in 2010. So mm. from testing, it wasn't great because we didn't have all that stuff. So I had to keep testing your own nine bike. Okay. And um, I did the Castle Coombe test at Honda and everyone do. And I had a huge high side, which when you're testing for road racing, you don't really crash, you know, so I thought, this is not going well at all. And I could see Plato and um, John having a bit of a smirk on the face that mm. I was getting, I would crashed, and mm. I'm not going to be that good at TT. And, mm. and then I was riding a 600 really good up, running at the front in British Super Sport. I did a couple of rounds where I did both stock and Super Sport, and I won the stock race. So I thought I'm pretty strong here, really. Mm. I went to the Northwest, won the 600 race. So I knew going into the TT, I could win on any of my bikes. Right. And then, and then obviously I had some luck because the first race, Connor was leading and his bike smacked into his clutch. Oh, so yeah. I won that race. Yeah. And then um, both 600 race, I just led from start to finish one and super stock race. I got a, a terrible start. I only did a couple of laps in practice with it. I'd had a flat front tire in practice. And lost the front of the veranda where Connor actually crashed. Right. And um, yeah, just it just came back and let's go. Because it was a flat tire, I presume it must have just bounced back because it was so it was bending off the rim rather than losing the front. So I got back to the paddock and said, I don't ever want to ride that bike again. And then done what I put the thing on and said, tire's flat, don't worry about it. So then on the line, I was thinking, last time I rode this thing, it nearly killed me. Yeah. So I set off pretty steady and fat crowds off like a madman. He only had a stocker that year, so all through practice had been riding it. And I ended up about 12, 13 seconds down. And then starting the last lap, I came out of Governor's Dip, and the marshals were flagging us down. You know there's a road that goes down to Douglas. Yeah. They were flagging me off to go down there. I thought, what's going on here? I thought, well, that's it then. That's my third win's not going to come. It must be in a firing pit lane or something. I started to pull off, and then they're like, no, 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 flagging me back on. And somebody had crashed coming out, and there's a massive pile of oil on the apex. Just trying to get you around trying it. Trying to get me around it. So it was probably the best thing that happened because I was absolutely fuming. And I just set off down rail, those throttle cables, were, I never let go of the throttle until I got to Quarterbridge. And uh, I did the first 130 mile an hour lap on a super stock bike and right. won the race by two seconds. Really? Just pulled all that time and back? 12 down, down yeah. Right, right. So, and then the second 600 race got camped. They wanted to run it on the Wednesday, it was absolutely pouring out, it was ridiculous. So, uh, there were branches on the start of finish straight. Mm. It was like a November night or something. And they said, yeah, yeah, it's going to go. I was like, what happened to the not racing in the wet thing mm. you said you were doing? So I said, well, not, not me <coughs> like, having a stomp or anything, but I'm not willing to race in this weather, so I'll be watching today. And I went, and they actually cancelled it. And then the next day, it was beautiful. So mm. Mm. best for everyone, really. And yeah. All the crowds are back out. No one really wants to go watch a wet TT, no, do they? No, no, and, no. Uh, I won. I won't own in the wet. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a bit lucky. And then straight into the scene here, I had a problem. The bike was leaking oil and my foot kept slipping off the peg. Oh, I remember they stopped it after a lap. Yeah, I came, well, I came in through the pit and I said, I've got a problem. The bike's leaking oil. I was in like fourth place. And they looked at it and said, it must have been like a bit of residue that was there. It's, you know, there's only a little bit on your foot peg. Carry on going. So lucky I did because I left the pit and then it got red flagged. I think that was guys. That was guys yeah. crash at Allegheny. So then we came back and then they weren't allowed to touch the bikes until the start time was announced for the restart. So as soon as that one announced, they all jumped on it and it was the, the alternator cover had a crack down it. So they put the hat on and I just thought, this is just meant to be, isn't it? I can't, I can't blow this now. No. So I just sat off like a scaldy cat in a senior really and, and won it. Yeah. Five in a week, just, I mean, did you, did you, you couldn't put a bet on it, could you, or did you? It'd be nice for would, wouldn't it, yeah, yeah. I don't know if, any, if anyone did have any, anything on that, but it, it just, you can't imagine it ever happen. I don't know, maybe it will happen again, maybe you'll do it again another time, but just to get everything to run smoothly, the bike and no pit stop problems and no anything, it's just extraordinary to happen. But then shit happened, Silverstone.
after that. You can't imagine that you could do, win five TTs at record-breaking times, go to Silverstone and nearly lose your leg. Mm. That, when you laid on the track there, I bet you can believe what was going on, could you? No, I mean, my life just couldn't have got any better at the time. I was absolutely loving it. And I remember you came to the British Grand Prix and it was yeah. all just rolling along, lovely, yeah. Went up to Scarborough, won the Gold Cup, was winning races in British. And then Silverstone was just a horrible weekend, like it always is, just yeah. dark and wet. And yeah. And they wanted to start the race, and it was just crazy, really. The load was on the grid saying it's not really right to go. The load of standing water, and they're just not interested. So into turn one, and Graham Gallon just had a tiny little high side on the inside of me, and ended up falling off. If I'd been about another foot further forward, it had completely wiped me out, and we'd have both slid out of the way. Yeah. If it had been a foot further forward, it wouldn't have touched me. Right. But because it just glanced me, it just knocked a bike from underneath me, and I fell in the track. And, uh, and this bike's like, it's happening past me, it's scary as thing ever, ever have. Bikes flying past you at yeah. that speed. And then the last one, the very last bike just rode into my leg, so I spun me around and seen my leg was just hanging off the lift, blown out the back of the leather in the room, so. Right. Big panic on and just thought, why now? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just can't, I mean, I would be done that you look at it and you think, just, yeah, what's happening? But even at that point, you probably couldn't have realised it was as bad as it was, could you? No, I thought, don't, don't panic too much because if you clean break through both bones, your leg would be hanging off. So just don't panic too much. And I thought, it'd be better, it's better to happen after what I've just done than yeah, before, eh? Right? Sure. Just kept trying to tell myself positive, really, but all I really wanted was morphine. Yeah, right. <laughs> But the first, the first prognosis was amputation, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. They took me to hospital. And my whole foot was dead. It, it was purple. So there's no blood supply. So I'm gonna have to cut it off. That's absolutely not a chance. Who was with you at this point? Yeah, uh, I think Sue Padgett had made it there because I got air ambulance. So I was in and out. They gave me ketamine. Right. So I went to I went on a space shuttle to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Seen a few like really, really weird things in this special. Uh, I thought I'd died and I'd been taken away. And I thought, why have I still got a smashed leg if I'm dead? I thought I'd been brand new. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then I got to hospital, obviously, came around a bit and Sue was there. And then this little uh, Asian guy kept coming and telling me that he was going to take me to theatre, take my leg off. I don't think I was too kind to him. Mm, right. but, um, He's here tonight, actually. <laughs> But, but so, you, but you're having to have arguments, you're on whatever they can give you and everything Yeah, else. I was like arguing, the next minute I'm asleep, and I'm back up arguing, and then I'm asleep. I think they just put me to sleep then. Right, but it must have been, was there someone in your corner there, like, telling them? Yeah, like I said to Sue, just, whatever, just don't let them take my leg off, just keep it, whatever. I, I don't understand what's going on, you know, I just wanted my leg. Mm. So I didn't know all the medical side, I just, mm. I just thought, you, you can surely do something. Mm. I just didn't know, I just wiped my leg. I said, I raised my bike, I can't raise me out of my leg. Mm. Do not take my leg off. Mm. Whatever happens, don't right. take my leg off. Right. And then they took me to theatre and put an external fixator, just the bars, not the frame, into my ankle and into the, my, just below my knee, just basically to get everything back in a line. Yeah. Left it all smashed. And then put me in a room with like these massive like nappies, I suppose, because it was just pouring blood out. So they're pumping blood in and it's just pouring out. And just wait to see if it came back. And obviously, there's three arteries to your foot. Two had been severed, right. and, and one was still going. So that got the blood supply back. So the colour came back. So then it, the leg was alive. Wow. So that was a whole different thing then. But then obviously there's still all the damage in there. So yeah. after about a week of just absolutely nothing happening to it, a surgeon came in, Mr. Kirkovich, and seen my X-ray on the screen, and he's quite obsessed with lower limb injuries. And uh, he said, I've seen your injuries very, very bad, and I'd like to uh, try to help you. And I said, well, anything you can try to do, I don't know what's happening. Was he a surgeon at Northampton General? <laughs> he was at uh, Coventry, I was there, lifted okay, right. So um, that was the start of it, really. He was, he was unbelievable. And you're still mates with him? Yeah, well, he's done this now. He's done this, so I, I bet he wished he'd never met you. He's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> turn into a lifelong job. We left Coventry after all my stuff. And uh, I said, he said, I'm, I'm go it was right at the end of my last time thing. I think I had my frame removed. No, I still had a frame on, but it was at the end of it. And he said, oh, I'm moving to Cambridge. And I said, well, you know exactly what I'm going to say. He said, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to take patients with me, but I'm going to take you. Right. So 
I went to Cambridge to have my frame taken off the first time. So then when it happened again, I was just immediately given the phone call and said, I broke my leg, you know. But did he get, he obviously got involved because you broke it when you were at the show at Motorcycle News because it hadn't yeah. healed properly, had it? it got... Yeah, it was infected, the bone was infected, yeah. we never knew, so it snapped there. That obviously created a whole new 18 months of grief. Right. And then I rang him, I wouldn't even let him take me to hospital in London, I said, I've just got to go to Coventry, seriously, Coventry. Right. I've just got to go to Coventry, so I went up there and then right. that was, that was a bad day because yeah. we found out it was infected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But kind of, I guess it was because it, it worked, because it all came back good in the end eventually, but it was three years? Yeah. I remember you having a couple of laps at the TT with a big frame on your leg yeah, for was. some parades, and then I remember you turning up, what were you on the Yamaha then when you got the carbon fibre frame on? And, and Hutchie came into a TV or compound, he says, don't tell anyone, but he took his frame, his carbon frame off, and the leg just went like that. It was just oh. still, it was only held together with that bit of carbon, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Where'd yeah, you that, finish? That was, that, that was the infected bit because yeah. he told me then. I went. He said, "We'll put the frame on from it breaking," and uh, he said, "It's a low energy frame. I can't understand why it's done it. Three months, it shouldn't be healed." He said, "I don't want to be X-raying it all the time. Just come back." So I went back on the first of April, and I've signed like, for Yamaha. So I kept telling him everything's all right. Back on the first of April, frame off Northwest TT. Obviously, I had to give up the British Superbike thing. Went on the first of April, he X-rayed it. He said bone's infected and we're going to have to remove about 150 centimetres of your tibia right. and it's going to take 18 months to fix. So I was just, my just world ended. Yeah. yeah, I just thought, oh, this can't happen. So I said, right, well, I've got a TT in three weeks, so <laughs> <laughs> we need to do something so that I can ride. Can we take the frame off and put a really thin cast on something? And I said, am I going to make my leg worse doing it? He said, well, you're going to have to be on a hideous strong dose of antibiotics because it's going to try to eat its way out of your leg and he said if you fall off you're going to cause a lot of damage obviously because it's broken so if i fall off there my legs move mm. least of my worries yeah, yeah. so uh he took the frame off and put this cast on which was not thin at all so then i had to go to a local place that made exhaust and bought some carbon fiber material and the resin went home wrapped the leg in cling film and wrapped this stuff around it I don't know if you know, it goes to about 110 degrees yeah. to set. So Burnt your leg, didn't it? Like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Try to get it to go off. And then it went off. I cut it off with some scissors at the back so I could take it off to wash. So it sort of snapped on and then I taped it up the back. And I told everyone I was brand new, I just put that on in case anyone rode into me or anything. Oh. And uh, I finished six at a TT with it. Yeah, and the leg was just wobbling around when you took it off. Doesn't bear thinking about. Um, anyway, we're all pleased to say you healed after that long long period you came back winning tts again it doesn't bear thinking about how many you might have won had you not of this three years or more um but unfortunately shit happened again uh you won two prior to that um and then it was the senior the big one it was neck and neck and it all went wrong going up the mountain talk us through that yeah i mean it was um I'd made some big changes with the bike from last year. Obviously, staying with the team again was a good thing for me. We knew what we needed. Um, the year before, we'd had to run a super stock engine in the senior race, which wasn't good. Um, so everything was looking good for the year after. And I moved back to Dunlop Tires that I'd been on pretty much all my career until right. my crash. Right. It was Paul Bird that actually made me go to Metzler's. Right. So I'd had a bad time in Macau mm. on the Metzler's and he blamed it all on the tyres and said that I, if, on the Dunlop On the Dunlop, side, right. And said if you're riding for me next year, you're on the Corellas and that's it, on right. Metzler's, whatever. Right. And then, so I had absolutely no options because no one wanted me to ride for him. So, right. But I had a good years on it and I won the three, six, uh, two 600 race in the Superstock race for two years running. I just knew I, I needed to be on the Dunlop to win the big bike race and mm. to try and convince Tyco after I think I've done 18 years as a team yeah. in Metzler that I'm going to come in and change him to Dunlop was not an easy thing but they went with it, you know, it was quite that, impressive. I was going to say it's pretty good because I'm assuming they probably got paid quite a lot of money by Metzler as well. Yeah, yeah. Metzler did pay them and Dunlop wouldn't give them a shilling. Right. So, but also me as well, I said, yeah, not just you, you know, I'm not getting anything, yeah, which right. I would if I stay on the Pirelli. So you've yeah. got to understand I'd rather win the race, would you or not? Yeah. So yeah. then we got so little time testing with them. We did a few days in Spain with it, and then all the tests in, in UK we had done that are blocked out by Honda, so you can't go unless you've got a Honda, so right. we never really got to ride until the North West on the bike, and, and then the TT every night was getting cancelled for the weather, yeah, yeah. so we were just yeah. so on the back foot, and then the first Superbike race just got a miracle hour, wasn't it really, because I was struggling so much with the bike, the pace was rubbish, 
and I was in like fourth and I was creeping away through the race, got into the lead and just sort of edged me away as safely as I could really to mm. try and win that race. And um, so the team would try to suss something out for the Friday for us to do and then the super stock race, a similar thing, I won by quite a decent margin but I was only doing 131, I did 133 the year before. Mm. So we were miles away, but a lot of it was because of weather as well. I was going to say the track wasn't was a bit green, I think. Yeah, wasn't the it? track yeah. was not in good condition and stuff. And, and then the 600 was a brand new 600 out this year. And uh, the team didn't really want to run it, it the other team arrived for mm. And um, I just begged them and begged them because I'd won the last four races. I just wanted a bit of a new challenge. And the bike wasn't totally new, but I had different things. And I wanted something just to excite me a bit mm. more, you know, and have this new bike. Uh, anyway, it was rushed so much in the end, a lot of things were missed and mm. we just, well, I was nowhere in the race, we had a massive issue and I finished fifth, so it was really devastating to go from winning the last four of those to, yeah. like, I couldn't even get a thing on the podium. And, and it was a bit of a damp race as well, it was not a good day that. So we had a second one of those to go at, which I was looking forward to because they'd found what was wrong and then it got cancelled completely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we never got another go at the 600. And then seeing here, everything was going well and, for me, the start of the race is always where I sort of just settle in, see where everyone is and do my own thing and then I'm really strong at the end of the race. So coming out of the gooseneck on lap two, our pit stops have been brilliant all year, the team worked to make on those over the winter. And I uh, came out of the gooseneck and my man was boarding me there. P1 plus two, I thought, we've got this now. Cruise over the mountain, my best bit, I always make time over there. Pit stops have been mega, we've been making time from the pit stop. Just rattles two middle laps off and then take the last two mm. as they come. Mm. And next minute I'm going up the road. Mm. I just thought, what's happened? Is this like, am I even at the TT? I mm. just could not believe it because I just never ever go to the TT thinking of crashing. You know? no. no. So, yeah, and then as soon as I came to a stop, you only ever get ridden over once in your life. So I, I was going to say, I watched it. I watched it and you literally just dragged yourself to the side dragged of the road. Dragged myself to the side. My leg was up here at first. You knew straight away again you got a broken yeah. leg. I had luminous green boots on it, it was next to my head, so I knew something was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, dragged myself away and my, my, my knee was up here on top of my thing. Like, oh, fucking hell. I just thought, again, it's just going to be one clean break. Don't worry about it. And then uh, I didn't know all about my ankle and stuff, so... What, what, what do you reckon broke that when you hit the wall or when? I don't know. I've got some. Vi there was a guy stood there with a camera, really good quality filming it, so I can see exactly what's happened. Well, I can. It's, it's, I've got lap one, lap two. <coughs> it's absolutely nothing different. The bike's exactly the same line. Everything's the same, and it's just really weird. It just. I think the bike took the barrier out, so I slid into the wall right. with no barrier because right. it, it bounced out with the bike. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's just hard, it's hard to see what my leg did because absolutely nothing else got injured. No. Uh, so, but yeah. so you were dragging yourself off another trip in the helicopter? I wasn't dragging but... myself off more. Uh. Pulling myself across the track. <laughs> Dragging um, yourself off somewhere else. Yeah, I think it probably is, yeah. But <laughs> not, not for the nice audience we've got here. Um, another spaceship ride. Yeah, I, was, I felt like I was on the side of the track forever. No one was there. I was sat on my own. And I took my helmet off because I've got a hump on my leathers. My neck was like, so I put my helmet back on. To sit there with my helmet and I had a drinks bottle in my thing, which was a good thing. So I was drinking that and I thought, oh, I'm going to need an operation. I'm best off not drinking that. So I sat not drinking that. And then eventually someone came and I was like, where's the medical team? I could hear an ambulance or a helicopter. Didn't know if it was TV or what it was. And it just seemed to take forever and everything. And then uh, finally they said, you know, we're giving you something now. And then I was off to the right. space shuttle. Um, yeah, because they stopped the race. The helicopter landed beside you, I guess, somewhere there. And yeah, went, went, went on for ages. Bike went past me at full speed. Yeah. <coughs> the, not one person slowed down there. Really, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was a broken femur and your ankle. Yeah, my ankle was dislocated. I knew there was always possible problems from my last crash with that because my ankle was sort of stuck almost at, at 90 before, it just had a tiny bit of drop in it right. and no tendons to lift it or anything, it didn't work so I'd gone to the right hand gear shift from the last injury so I knew if it ever got pulled down it, break. it was going to be a problem because it didn't want to go down right. so that's obviously what happened, it got pulled down right. popped out the tailless bone which is in the middle of your ankle <coughs> and the tailless bone is only blood supplies from blood vessels right. so once it's dislocated it's dead, it'll never be alive again right. so they shoved it back in at Liverpool but it's never going to survive so when I went down to Cambridge they had to remove it, cut the bottom of my leg off and shorten my leg to fuse it 
So it's a fused ankle now? Fused ankle, and then put the full frame on, broke my tibia just below my knee, and then I've had to spend 50 days lengthening it to get the length back. Did you know you were coming to a medical conference? <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, I guess when you finally do win lots more TTs and go back, you can be a doctor, can you? You can be a, some sort of bone surgeon or something like that. So you don't, a fused ankle's not a problem for you, you use thumb rear brake, so it's just got to sit on the footrest. Yeah, I think a fused ankle actually a little bit better in normal life for me because I had a little bit of drop foot before, so I used to catch my toes quite a lot. And, and so so they twe tweaked it up a bit? Yeah, they sort of gave me a prescription to alter the rods <laughs> until it was touching. And then uh, I said where I roughly wanted it to be. And unfortunately, when you get a frame on it, it, won't, it stops your knee going fully straight. So it's hard to know that it's at 90, so I've just done it by sitting down, basically. You put your heel on the floor, and if your toes aren't touching, then it must be. Right. A bit higher than and that. so they've basically just set it in where you wanted yeah, it. Yeah, it's like a, there's loads of rods at the bottom at all different angles. So the prescription will tell you two mil on one, a mil on another, not turn another, and then you'll have like <laughs> ten days of different okay. sort of pull. So you tweak that yourself each I day. I try to skip a few days, but I tell you the pain is insane. I bet if you don't do it each day. Yeah, you have to just chip away. What you've got a spanner at home, have you? Or something? You can do them with your fingers. All right. Yeah. So you don't have to have a factory mechanic or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> When's that due off? So the ankle he reckons is fused now, so I've got a scan on Monday, to co if that's confirmed, that hideous foot plate, like a clown shoe, can come off. Right. And then I can get a normal shoe on at least and start weight bearing. Right. And then um, the rest of the frame, because of the lengthening, that takes five months. A month for every centimetre, so... You must have loads of brand new left shoes around. You must have. It's been, it's been years and years, hasn't it? Tracky pants are a thing. I'm sick of wearing tracky pants. I bet, yeah, because that's all you can wear and bits and pieces yeah. like that. Do you um, keep in touch with John McGuinness? John yeah, McGuinness, I've been he's in the same position. John a lot from the start because obviously he's, he's got a frame on and uh, try to tell him a lot of the tricks of the train and stuff to get round and stuff what's going to happen. And uh, he's having a bit of a rough time with the infection a lot with his pin sites. So. Why? Is he? What were yeah. the pins in there? And yeah, one of his pin sites. I'm, I'm quite concerned for him actually because that was the start of why my bone got infected. So right. he's got a pin side that keeps getting it's the third time it's been Is infected. It? Right. So. And what they have to keep going in and cleaning it up and everything? Well, they put you on antibiotics, but if it's in the bone, you can never kill it because there's metal. Right. The metal, it, you can't kill a bug that's on metal. Oh, I see. The antibiotics never get to it, so... Oh, okay, so... Uh, you just got your helicopter licence? I mean, the, the, the peaks... <laughs> but the, the peaks and troughs, I mean, people would never understand it realistically. I mean, it's just one minute you're there, then you're down, and then, you, and then you're below ground and you're back up, and it was all going so well, looking good. Uh, and then you flew yourself to the Isle of Man, and then... Uh, it just... Just can't believe it at times, can you? No. When you're going through the bad time, the big bad time, the 18 months, two years, what the hell were you living on? I mean, you had no income, I guess. No, I mean, I wasn't totally skinned, unfortunately. The only thing that skinned me was buying a house. I put right. everything into a house that I bought. I did a lot of renovating, I sort of skinned myself to buy it. But it was always there, so it wasn't like I was totally... I didn't have any money in the bank, but I wasn't skinned. Right. So, I bought lots of bikes and... I had all kinds of things, so if I needed to sell something, I'd sell something. Right. I kept going to things, and I did a tour of England doing the, right. the museum, uh, doing the theatre tour. Right. I just kept as much as I could, a bit right. of involvement with teams and right. going to events, and I kept going through it. But <coughs> Have you got a contract now? Yeah, uh, for next year I haven't actually, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, are you talking to someone? I mean, just Well, I'm hoping to stay where I am, but right. there's been a little bit of uh, confusion over certain aspects of my contract. Probably the fee, the yes. way you negotiated the last, <laughs> the last one. Uh, Neil Tux has been and had a word with them probably. Um, but you're hoping to be with Tycho again um, next year. Will you be ready next year? Yeah, I've got this lot on until at least the end of December, the main, the main part of the frame. If you see an X-ray on my femur, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's in tatters. Is it? But it's four months on now. And I had an x-ray probably three weeks ago. And it looks exactly the same as the day it happened, but he assures me it's healed. Oh. <laughs> and this is your mate? This is my man. Yeah. He says, no problem, it's healed. But like, look at the fucking state of it. <laughs> oh. Well, it's not matter if it's not pretty, as long as, it, long as it's strong. Does it feel strong? Well, I can't, I can't put weight through Oh, right, so you can't test it, right? I've been non weight bearing because of that. Well, this I had to be non-weight bearing for at least three months with this, because yeah. I've only got a plate in here, so the plate will snap. 
but he said if you didn't have a foot plate on now, you could walk on this. Right. He said obviously it's not healed, healed, finished. No, 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 no. It took like two years to look like a normal bone again. Right. It probably never, well, it never will look normal, normal, because a bit came off that's like gone around the back and it's attached on the side, and <laughs> so it's like it's going to end up a bit bulk somewhere. But did your mate, the surgeon, actually do all the work on that leg, though? Yeah, the yeah. scary thing at Liverpool was they put that sort of framework thing on the, the first night to, but they put my ankle bone back in and put that frame thing on, right. and then they left everything, right. stitched it back up. This was still bent in half when I woke up. Mm. And then they said, uh, your, fem your femur's like really bad and um, we don't know what to do. Mm. So I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. If you don't know what to do, you've got a problem. So I said, right, don't do anything then, don't touch it. Let me ring my surgeon. So I rang him and he actually talked him through what to do with this. Did he? So they did it in Liverpool, but he told them what to do. Mm. And then I went down and he was happy with what they'd done. So then he just sorted all this up that they'd not done. Wow. Uh, it, that, that guy, it, obviously you've got oh, a great debt to, and I know you have looked up what well, you've kept Mason all the way through, but I suspect he's probably going to be moving to Istanbul so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to get away from you. If it all, when it all comes off, it's all working, where, where, where can we expect to see Ian Hutchison riding first next year? Then? What's your uh, plan? Well, What's plan to, A? I'm back to not doing the British Championship just because... I don't really want the pressure of having to try and win a race in April. I want to just go and have right. some fun testing, yeah. being fit and ready to ride. Mainly ride on the Dunlop tyres instead of doing British Championship proper rallies. Right. And uh, so the first race will be the North West. Right. So you want to be out somewhere if you can early time testing somewhere. March, yeah. March time and stuff like that. You are a friggin' miracle, there is no <laughs> doubt. You're completely nuts, we know that. But you're, you're a lovely man and I think a big, big round of applause. <laughs> Just to say, I know you're going to say also, but Hutchie is going to go at the back of the room Absolutely. and he's got books and pictures yeah, and, exactly. and if you don't take one of them home, you should do. Yeah. Absolutely, you've stole my life. Oh, sorry well, about that. There you go. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you've got some questions for both Ian and Steve. So we've got two roving microphones tonight, such as the crowd. So if anyone has a question to kickstart the evening. Oh, you would be yeah, right. He's having a giggle, back, isn't he, at yeah. the back there? At the back. Tim, that's yours, OK? Anyone over this side, I'll take next. OK, so thank you. I kind of do want to ask this question, but I kind of don't. So... Right. <laughs> when you retire, what are you going to do? Uh, Ambulance driver. <laughs> No, I, with the helicopter license is going to come in handy. You can be doing the air ambulance, I think. I try not to think about retirement, really, because you, you never know what's around the corner. You could be fin I could be finished now. I could have been finished in 2010. Or I could go on for another 10 years. Hopefully I won't do, because not, I don't think I can go through it all for that long. But, yeah, I've got a little aim. That I definitely want to win more team teams. Last time... I won eight when it happened, and there was absolutely no way I was satisfied with ATT wins. So I've won eight again, and it's happened again. So I think next time I win seven, it's time to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. probably, probably that's that's it. Yeah, yeah stop stop with that, that many. Okay, next question, the gentleman over here. There you go, sir. Um, at your short circuit racing, you always have a warm-up lap, the sighting lap. But the TT, and especially this year, there was a lot of damp conditions. How do you go about gauging at what sort of pace to go at? Or is it all on previous knowledge from previous races in bad conditions? Yeah, I mean, the damp conditions are just horrendous because you've no idea at all where it is. And I got caught out twice this year, once in, in practice week on the superbike out of Ginger Hall. I just came round the corner and under the trees, full lean full gas in fourth gear and it just went wet just like that and uh, that went there and then uh, I had another one in the 600 first lap of the 600 at Hillbury same again you tip into Hillbury flat out I think it's fifth gear or something and uh, as soon as I apexed got back on the gas full and it was damp under the trees I was back out of the seat there so you're just on a wing and a prayer really that's why I don't really like to be racing in those conditions at the TT I don't think it's really fair for anyone but the thing we know, sighting lap on a, on a normal day, 
you just have to get a feel for your bike, you know, they feel horrendous. They've got 24 litres of fuel on when you get down to Court Bridge, they don't want to stop. You just have to be sensible, really. You have to obviously try hard, but sensibly. But you've kind of been saying that the first lap is so important as well. So it's a real balance, isn't it, to try and... Yeah, I mean, the bikes are so close now. It's so easy to control the race when you've got a gap. Yeah. If you've got 10 seconds and someone... You've got six sectors now that everybody knows. They've got information on an iPad or a laptop or whatever. They've got six pit boards. You know within three minutes what someone's made up on you. Yeah. So it's so easy to just up your pace or slow your pace. It's not like you're waiting half a lap or a right. full lap. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the first lap is mega important. Even the first sector is mega important. Yeah. Right. Another question, maybe? From the, oh, George, thank you, I haven't got to run. Just, can I just ask? Steve Stavros, how's the MAD Tour going? Um, MAD Tour is going really well, thank you. We've just got one more left this year. We've done 12 so far this year. We're at Burnham on the Sea near Bristol on Saturday night, and that's it for this year. Um, but we'll be doing it again next year. I can't believe it. We keep getting invited back to places, and we're definitely going to be at the TT and at the Classic TT next year. So if you're going out there, be a good chance. Come out, see Hachi win his next, his 17th, 18th, or whatever TT, uh, and come to the MAD Tour. But it's going really well. Um, if you don't know the MAD Tour, is hosted by my daughter, and the Mad Tour stands for my adolescent dad. And <laughs> the poor child, uh, it's amazing that the authorities didn't take her away from me when she was young, but they didn't. <laughs> so it's going very, very well, thank you. Good. Next question. Ian, you said you hope to win more TTs. Would you stop before Joey's record, like John McGuinness said he would do? No, and I don't believe John ever would either. <laughs> No, I don't either. Well, unless you get a visitation from someone that does kneecaps or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it just shows how hard it is to get to that figure because Joey got hurt as well, so he missed some years. And, yeah. You know, the, it, no one's. Uh, uh, Mike Hillwood at 14, he was the next man down for years and years and years. Yeah. And obviously, John's shot up to 21 plus two shit bike races. Mm. And then, uh, <laughs> 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 so you don't like the electric races then? <laughs> no. no. And then myself uh, and Mike are obviously going to do so. It's, yeah, it's just so weird to know what's going to happen. And obviously, if you're going to try to be the best, you want to be the best, you're not going to stop because someone else is the best. That's like not winning a race because mm. you're yeah. looking up to them, you know. Thank you. Another question maybe from Side over there. There's one right down the front here. In fact, it's the nurse. It's the nurse. Okay, no problem. I've got one in the car, don't worry. Um, may I ask you, you always talk about being careful riding a lap, you know, your first lap or your first bit on the lap. Are you touched by madness or are you obsessed? What sort of motivates you to, you know? Right, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, for instance, not just you, Guy Martin, Connor Cummings, you know, John McGuinness, you all have had catastrophic crashes and you still sort of wake up and go, right, don't take my leg off. It's almost like, don't cut my leathers off, I need them. What motivates you? What keeps you obsessed to do yet another lap? knowing that it could really kill you. I think the problem is, it, it's so good when it's good. You just want that feeling. And obviously, you know, there's, there's all the, the racing side of winning, and most of us are pretty thick and had really shit job before we started racing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we well, know you had a problem with John McGinnis was a, what was he, a muscle collector, wasn't he? He <laughs> pretends to be a brick, he's never learned from a brick. That's true. Um, actually, just to round it up, I can answer that question. It's fear of a proper job. Seriously. And, and, and as Ian actually just said, that you, you, you're living the dream. You're having such a wonderful time. And it's very difficult to stop doing that when you know that you're still capable of doing it. I think if, if you felt you lost it and you weren't, hadn't got the pace, it would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? But when you know you're going and you've got the pace, very difficult to stop. Because it's just the reality, you don't want to go back and do a 9 to 5 job, you know, no matter how much, how much that hurts. However long, you know, three years in the grand scheme of things, whatever, it's a short time in your life. When you come back and it's all mega again, and you've not got a real job, you're a bike racer, it's all back good again, you know, I think that's all you look for, really. Good, I think we have another question over that side, Jim. Um, I wonder who your favourite all-time racer is, either living or... Um, no longer with us. 
always DJ because for what he did, for short circuit racing and road racing, and um, just never really got the proper chance in short circuit racing because of his size, you know. But what he achieved was awesome. Mm. Yeah, he was he was the man, wasn't he? He was also going to go on to great <coughs> things uh, at the TT. <coughs> Would you consider going into cars after bikes? Funny you should say that. <laughs> You've got a bit of metal work around you in a car, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had some touring car drivers message me about after my accident this time saying, you've got to get in a car, but the problem is, they've all got squilly in their dads and they pay a fortune to drive cars, and I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm in it to, as my job not to pay to do it. Yeah. So. Actually, I could name you. I interviewed last week. He was over here. Aaron Sly, cost him a fortune. He had a year touring car race, and then he used all his own money and basically gobbled up half his salaries and everything else on things like that. But it's a bit difficult getting into a form of racing. Everyone says, "Oh, you must do it," but then they also say, "Well, that will cost you 250 grand to do it." So uh, unless you've got a budget behind you, it's nearly impossible. Unless you've got, I guess, a sponsor or someone that wanted to take you to do that. But there's nowhere near as much fun, is it? Definitely more, less painful, but nowhere near as much money. So, no, no doubt about it. Have your parents changed their views on motorcycles? <laughs> They're such lovely people as well, they really are. Yeah, their views were always not for me to ride a motorbike, so... It's not gone down too well. <laughs> Do you get that? Do you still get that? I told you so. <laughs> not really. I mean, they, they have been so supportive of it with me. And, you know, at the end of the day, I suppose they have to be. You know, it's what I've chosen to do. And it, if they're going to enjoy the good times, they've got to enjoy the bad times. Yeah. I have been fortunate. You know, I started racing in 2000. So in 17 years, I've had two. Two injuries just unfortunately being bad. Mm, they've they've so, been pretty uh, major ones, haven't they? Um, does your mum come? To, she does come to the races. No, the last time my mum came was a disaster. Oh, right. She came to the northwest, and it was my first time back from my first leg crash. And I had a, the bike cut out coming out of the middle of a ground bike, flipped me off. I don't know if you remember in practice. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. My fingers got trapped underneath it, so I got taken straight to hospital. So they don't, all they get to hear is that you've gone to hospital. They're stuck in the middle of a paddock, can't move anywhere. So I went in the ambulance to hospital, got, they pulled my nails off and stuff and stitched up the side of my fingers. And uh, took, I said, I need to get back to one more session then. And I won't qualify if I don't ride. So they took me back, dropped me off at the, middle, at the big roundabout, magic roundabout. I walked out into the roundabout and the, the back marker car, whatever it is, yeah, safety car, course, course came around. So I jumped in that, they took me back to the paddock, ran up in the truck, got a new helmet out, got my new gloves out. And walking through the paddock, this massive thing on my finger wrapped up. Try to put my helmet and my gloves on. My mum came down, just saw me, and just burst into tears. <laughs> so I was like, oh, fuck. So I said, Mum, you've got to stop coming and I just legged it down to the <laughs> <laughs> So she stopped coming. Oh, it's fine. I, can't, I can't imagine what it must be like. Okay, we have another question there, thank you. Um, how do you find it affects your, your fitness when you spend so much time injured? You need a good level of fitness to be able to race properly. How do you get that back and how quickly? Well, last time I, I had to start doing it whilst the, the leg was still smashed because the timing-wise I needed to be fit. It was, it was always coming off around September-ish and I wanted to race in Macau. So it was so difficult last time. I was training with my frame on, going out abroad, swimming in the sea, trying to learn to walk in the sea because I'd been on weight round for so long and uh, just doing everything I could. It was never really strong uh, and I wasn't very fit, but I was fit enough, obviously, to race. And, and then this time, maybe a, bit, a little bit better for me if this comes off in December and I've got a good chunk of time to try to get fit. But you, as long as you're at a good level when it happens to you, you only really need six weeks to be fully fit. The, the biggest problem is getting the, the, the muscle back because you have muscle wastage within two weeks and that just does not want to come back. It's a nightmare trying to get a leg built back up. Do you, um, just so you've been swimming? Yeah, I was swimming two weeks ago because he said that my ankle had healed and the foot plate might come off, so I thought, right, there's no chance I'll be able to walk because I've got no strength in my leg. Right. So I went straight up to Spain and got in a pool every day, right. did some swimming, nearly died. <laughs> and, 
had to spend three days in bed because I'd overdone it. Oh really? <laughs> but it was alright, it got some strength in that but it's alright, yeah. Okay. And then you had your 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 blood clot. Yeah. Oh sweet. Yeah, yeah that's I, I had one already, I had one. Apparently when you smash a femur, there's about a litre of blood in it and it just pulls and it clots and the clots can break free and then they get up into your heart and go off wherever. So I had one about three weeks after the accident. I was already in hospital at the time, luckily, so they put me on blood thinners to sort that out and said, um, just stay on it for three months and then stop. So I stopped three weeks ago thinking, hmm. should I really be stopping this? Anyway, obviously not because another one's gone up and uh, got me again on Monday. So, so you're back on Wolfram or equipment? Yeah, I'm, I'm on a tablet form this time because last time I had to inject every day into my stomach. So right. it's, uh, the tablets are non-reversal, so if you need an operation, you can't have one. Whereas last time I needed an operation. So, um, is she, your girlfriend, is she a nurse? She's going to be. She? <laughs> you definitely need to find a nurse to come and live with you, I'm, I'm sure of that. Hi. Any more questions before we close? Okay, one there, sir. You have a locked ankle, which means you just are unable to do that and move the gear either. That's fine, so you can move the gear shift to somewhere else. If your leg had been amputated, you'd have had a British foot. Would you have still raced? Um, I'm interested to know because I rode trials riding 17 years after mine. And I just wonder what you're, what you're feeling about it because you don't need it. You need the knee. Would you race? I don't think I would to be honest because you need to feel, you know, the feeling of everything from the bike goes through your foot. I agree. That, just that sensation of knowing what your back tyre is doing and what everything is yeah. doing you need that. That sense comes through your foot, that's all you need. If you've got that, then you can ride a bike. If you've just got a piece of plastic touching that peg, you're not going to be very good. You'll be able to ride, and I'm sure you could be pretty quick, but you're not going to be doing what you need to do to it. Okay. You've still got feeling, I take it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I've always had feeling. Okay. Right. We'll probably make that the last question. Ian Hutchinson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> But for every um, motorsport legend that comes to talk to us, we'd like to present you with a piece of genuine 1907 Brooklyn's track. Okay? <laughs> Money can't buy that, Ian. So. <laughs> Mr. Parrish, one wow. for you as well. Thank All right, you. thank you. Very kind of and it has been polished and washed and it's all yours to keep. And that's so, a part of Brooklyn circuit. That's it? part of the circuit. Genuine 1907 track. Okay. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. thank Brilliant. you these guys for being here. Yeah. Well done, thank you. Um, uh, you better get to the back of the room. No, we're going to sure. do, we're just going to... Oh, sorry, big pardon. <laughs> sorry, I'm, prem I'm premature again. <laughs> Don't start. I just tell him, talking about fitness, Hutch, you just said, I don't know if you know, I joined a gym about three weeks ago. I'd only been there, well, yeah, three weeks, found a hole in my trainer I could fit, get my finger in, and she complained I got thrown out of the gym. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, we're going to do an auction now. Um, Ian, if we can get you to sign that, we're just going to do a quick auction. Okay. All right. Now, you're good at this auctioning stuff. Oh, I can do my very best. All right. Hutch is going to sign it. It is Windy Corner. Uh, you want me to sign it as well? Yeah, both okay. of you. Happy to do that. Have you had any moments at Windy Corner? No? <laughs> Don't believe that. Okay, a couple of items. First of all, do you want to do that one first? Right, do the flag first, yeah, if you the like. There we go, the genuine the Isle of Man flag, the three legs of the Isle of Man, signed by Mr Ian Hutchinson and my good self. Um, and one of these, it's got a price tag on it already, and it's normally 15 quid. So start me off with double somebody. 30 quid, somebody give me this. 30 pounds for this. 
first bid, if we don't get 30, I'm going to go to 20. Oh, I've got 30. Thank 30. you. 35, somebody. We're going five, should we? I've got 30 down the back now. I've got 35. Am I gentlemen putting it white up? Is that a bid or are you just waving your program? No, you put your program now. So I've still got 30 pounds. Anyone of you been to the Isle of Man? I've got 35. Thank you very much, Steve. Who's been to the Isle of Man? I've got 40. No, I'm kidding. That's 40. Uh, 35 down there, I want to give me 40 pounds. 35, 40, thank you very much indeed. I've got 40, 45, somebody possibly at 40 I've got down here. 45, maybe we might be hearing at 45, thank you. It's all the ladies that are bidding tonight. 45, the lady sitting right in front of me. They want 50, thank you very much indeed. I've got 50 on my right here. We are selling this at 50 pounds. Am I going to get 55, anybody? At 50 pounds, I have, thank you. 55, I've got at the back. Gentlemen's on the bidding on the right hand side at 55 pounds. 60 pounds, anybody? 60 pounds, we've got, thank you, lady at 60 pounds in front of me, at 60 pounds, 65 back down here, do you know each other? 65 pounds I've got on my right down at the front here, the, uh, the lady that wants to be a nurse, at uh, 65 pounds, anyone want to give me 70, we'll go for 70, but if not we're selling at 60, 70 pounds I've got, at 70 pounds on my right hand side at the back. At 70 pounds. Anyone want to go to 75? At 70 pounds. 75 down the front here. It's down at the front at 75 pounds. At 75, I'm looking for 80 if we can get it, but at 70 pounds, 5 pounds. Thank you. We've got 80 at the back of the room. I've got 80 pounds. Come back here at 85. Someone definitely wants it down here. 85 pounds I've got for this Isle of Man flag. Signed by Ian Hutchinson. 16 times winner. 85 pounds once. At 85 twice. At 85, sold to you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Big round of applause. All going to a good cause. Barriers, I believe, isn't it? Barriers. Barriers. Yeah. barriers. Yeah. We need more barriers. Right. Windy Corner. Windy Corner is what it is. It's very, very windy. It's on the drop back down from the mountain. Um, and it's a fairly fast right-hander now. It used to be uh, much slower. Uh, and it's a spectacular place to go and watch as long as it's a nice day. One of these signs, uh, limited edition of course, it's now signed by myself and Ian Hutchinson. Someone please start me off at £40. £40 I've got, thank you very much. Is that a bid? Am I seeing a bid over there? No, someone put his glasses on. Sorry, for, £40, thank you very much indeed. I've got £40, I'm looking for £45. 45 down at the front here. 50, thank you very much indeed. 55, anyone at 50 in front of me? Looking for 55, I've got 50 right in front of me. 55, lady at the back, thank you very much indeed. 55, looking for 60, thank you, back with you sir, 60 pounds. 65, somebody at 60 pounds, right in front of me. It is being sold, 60 pounds I've got, and it's 65, thank you. Right down the front here, 65. Would you like to go 70 at the back there? 70 I've got, thank you very much. It's 70 pounds on my right hand side. No one on the lift is bidding, bidding, thank you. At 75 I've got there in front of me. 75 pounds I've got, looking for 80. At 75 pounds we've got, right at the back where I can't see it, but I'm trusting. 80, you've got it. 80 pounds right at the very back. 85, anybody? 85 back in the middle. 100 pounds, bid of 100 pounds right in front of me. Well done, sir. At 100 pounds, anyone want to go any more than 100 pounds for this lovely sign signed by Hutchie? At 100 pounds, once at 100 pounds, twice sold to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed for that bid. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve, as ever. Absolutely. Um, the uh, next little bit before we finish is the raffle. They're all green tickets, so dig deep in your pockets. My glamorous assistant will uh, make it all happen. There we go. Okay, so.